Dharma talk. And the, um, the theme for the talk this evening is um, speculation, uncertainty, and not knowing. So in, in mid-March of this year, just after I got back from Melbourne when all this started up and I'd had to cancel the Communicating Mindfully workshop, just after that, I joined a, a, a Zoom meeting which replaced a, um, a big two-day conference in Byron Bay um, presented by Local Futures, Helena Nor Norberg Hodges organisation. And one of my favourite um, writers and philosophers was there called Charles Eisenstein. And he wrote the book, um, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible and Climate A New Story. And I like his writing particularly because he's not afraid to present a varying range of, of views um, when, on any issue that he's examining. In fact, he, the, the, he likes to do that. So I was very excited to see him in the Zoom window and to hear him speak. And many messages were coming down the chat box at the side of the Zoom window. You've probably all seen the chat box. If you haven't, there's a little uh, icon on the bottom of the screen. You can open up the chat box. Anyway, whilst things were going on, people were sending messages to him. What shall we do? What, well, you know, or wanting answers from him, wanting um, very clear answers from him. And I was watching him. He seemed to be getting more and more unsettled. And then he said, um, and this is a paraphrase of what he said, I don't actually know what is going on. And I wish that a lot of people didn't think that they know what is going on. Anyway, he subsequently, about two weeks after that, he published an article that he was writing at the time, which is available online if anyone wants to read it. So it seems that we're inundated with too much information, especially now that we're online and, and listening to so much different media platforms and so on. And there's a huge amount of speculation. And Speculation is a normal function of the media. You, you notice, especially during elections, um, people, um, it, it's often, and speculation is often presented with great certainty, which is, I think, a very unsettling thing. And at the best of times, it's a fruitless activity because mostly any speculation you've heard on the media, it doesn't turn out to be what happens. So the Buddha called this mental fabrication or papancha. And a lot of the things that we actually worry about as well it don't turn out to be what happens. So um, it's a sea we swim in, a sea of speculation. And I, after I gave this talk yesterday to the women's group, they also um, talked about how on some platform, online platforms are involved in how much speculation was happening. So it's a natural thing. The, the mind naturally wants to know. So speculation is just trying to know. And we have many conversations in our normal life. You know, if someone doesn't turn up on time for a dinner or a meeting or something that you're going to do together, everybody starts putting their idea forward of what's happened to the person. Oh, this is probably what's happening. That's probably what's happening and so on. It's a great um, waste of time and exercise in pretending and trying to know. And if you grow food, like I've been doing for decades, if you're in, into any sort of farming activity, you know that you can't be certain about anything and I grow carrots for the community here where I live and last year the carrots were absolutely fabulous huge and and absolutely flourishing and someone said to me oh we're going to have so many carrots this year and I said no all we can say is right now there are a lot of carrots 
And then what happened just before the drought was a very late um, rainy season and carrots hate rain and a lot of them rotted. So we also got a lot as well, but this is what's happened. We can, you know, all you can say about the people not turning up is they haven't turned up yet. All you can say is that right now there's a lot of carrots. So we need to really notice that, um, specul that habit of speculation that we do. Because uncertainty is the nature of existence. Life, as we know, life is constantly in flux and therefore we constantly face uncertainty. But maybe now the uncertainty is way more evident, even though the Dharma teachings keep on reminding us of the fundamental uncertainty of all things. We face a collective uncertainty, perhaps not experienced before. And of course, many of us have experienced high levels of personal or individual uncertainty at times in our lives. But it seems not this level of collective uncertainty that we're facing now. And whether it's global or individual, speculation, mental fabrication, papancha, as the word is in Pali, will only obstruct our hearts and minds and limit our ability to respond with wisdom, creativity and love. Because we are all right now in deeply unfamiliar territory. And we have to make decisions, many of us, without the usual map. And that, or the map that we're um, accustomed to, and that alone should be a reminder to remember the timeless maps of the Dharma wisdom, which the late Burmese teacher, Sayadaw Upandita, called the life raft of mindfulness. And we need that life raft of mindfulness because it's a time of no place to hide, no escape in our usual distractions. We are slap bang face to face with our mind and the enormous capacity of mind, all our minds to hinder themselves with desire and aversion and get tangled in an imagined future that is not in our control. And when the mind is obstructed in this way, we cannot connect with our body, with our feelings or notice the states of desire and aversion because the focus is on, we, on what we want, what we don't want. And this magnifies our distress and our disconnection. And it is a very scary time for a lot of people. And the Dharma offers empowering and something it offers empowerment and it offers something that we can trust. We can trust it because we can check it out for ourselves and make it real for ourselves. And the Buddha always loved to say that, that you can check this out. Don't just believe what's said by many people, check it out for yourself. And you can check this out in your very own heart, in your internal world. Do you remember that young woman, Jessica Watson, who was 16 years old in 2009 and she sailed solo around the world? And I heard her speak at a writer's festival shortly, uh, the year after she'd um, done the trip. And she said that she had to trust in something. And the thing that she trusted in was her boat. And she believed that was strong enough to withstand the massive waves in the Atlantic Ocean and the general vicissitudes of a journey on the sea like that. And this trust in her boat is what got her through, even when the boat was capsized and she was upside down in the ocean. And many of us probably feel something like that, that we're upside down in the ocean. But the practice of mindfulness is an invitation to the simplicity of presence, to not get caught in past longing or future speculation, just the simplicity of this right now, just this right now. 
So whenever you are walking, sitting, standing, eating, talking, feeling, and feeling the ever-changing array of emotions that are upon, us, are upon us all, something like grief, fear, terror, joy, happiness, and these sensations that come and go, or the fleeting transitory moments of, of our every day that can also bring wonder, or expansiveness and intimacy. That's what we will notice if we, our mind is present with the, the sense doors, with what is happening just right now, not getting caught in thoughts and speculation. And the other morning, not so long ago, I woke with incredible heaviness in my body. And so the practice was just heaviness, to be with the heaviness. And the life what raft of presence with that sensation saw it fade and dissolve eventually. So there was no need to speculate about what it was or try and fix it or, or distract from it. And that is the life raft of what the Dharma offers. We can rest in that simplicity of presence of mind. And that resting in that simplicity also deepens our practice. And quite amazingly, um, a couple of days later, I had a very big insight into that heaviness, which will be my next Dharma talk. So you'll have to wait for that. But that was the most exciting thing. That presence of mind deepens our practice. And the more we trust that, the deeper we will go into uh, uh, discovering the peace of mind that we all long for. So uncertainty and not knowing. It's not surprising that we don't like them because there are lots of reasons that they f that uncertainty and not knowing feels unsafe and this is conditioned by our past experience so many of us in you know past experiences of school of being shamed for not knowing we're very afraid of not knowing because we were shown up in a group of people to not know and it was very shameful and if we grew up, if we sadly grew up in an unreliable, violent family or had unattuned parenting, we needed to know what was, what, how to protect ourselves. So we need to be very vigilant about what was going on in the family so that we could maybe fly under the radar somewhere and keep ourselves safe. So knowing was a strategy for safety when we were young. And, and we also have a sense that if we know something, there's, we feel powerful. So there's lots of reasons that we cling on to certainty and knowing. So it's not an easy practice to observe the mind's attachment to knowing. It's, it's a way not easy practice. So every time we notice ourselves getting caught in trying to know, it's good to just acknowledge that you've noticed that and let it go. Because every time you do that, you release that attachment to knowing. And the system, your, your nervous system starts to relax. The heart mind starts to relax. And we land more viscerally. We, we land more voluptuously, let's say, in presence of mind. So when we are in touch with all the sense doors, with presence of mind, we can notice the flow of feelings and sensations. We notice sounds and colours, textures, aromas, taste, all the embodied experiences. And many feelings and sensations will arise for all of us, just allowing them free, free, free passage through the body releases the tension. 
So every day our emotional world will surprise us as we navigate this incredibly uncharted territory we find ourselves in. And our connection with ourself, you can see it as a generous surrender to the moment. And in this surrender, there is spaciousness for self-compassion, kindness to oneself. And then that naturally extends to others. Because when we are not shutting out any part of our being, the heart opens to others and the world. And that moment is transformed into wisdom and compassion for life itself, whatever the experience that's arising. So letting go of certainty is not about having a blank mind or not being able to make decisions. It's about having a heart and mind that is open to the flow of moment by moment experience. And in opening to intimacy with the moment, there, there will be joy, wonder, surprise, and a clarity that supports any dis decision you might have to make in this moment. So the life raft of uh, Sayadaw Upandita and the yacht, the boat of um, Jessica Watson's boat, they are metaphors. They are metaphors for something to trust in. So we must remember that they are metaphors because we are learning not to cling to objects. We're learning not to cling to objects which are constructed things. They are conditioned things. Things such as a boat or a raft is made out of many parts and that's what a conditioned thing is. For, all, for we know if we've had any length of Dharma practice or any length of observation of life, that all conditioned things, all constructed things come to an end. And it is in the having, there is always the not having. In the having is always the not having. And the um, wonderful um, forest monk Ajahn Chah, who was a, is a, a teacher of many of the um, well-known teachers that you would know in the, the, from the United States. He was a forest monk and he didn't have any possessions except his robe and his begging bowl. And one day someone gave him a, a cup and he held up the cup and he said, this cup is already broken. So that is a deep seeing into the having. There is always the not having. It's very important that we keep our eye on this and we keep our eye and our heart open to this reality. Because our true peace is found in a mind that is not conditioned that is unconditioned by desire, by aversion, by clinging. That is our ongoing practice, to reach the other shore. And the other shore is also a metaphor for peace and freedom. So I'd like to um, finish with um, it's a beautiful poem from a collection of um, poems by um, early Buddhist nuns. And this is a collection, this is the world's oldest collection of women's literature, and it's just been published. It's called The First Free Women, Poems of Early Buddhist Nuns, by collection by Matty Weingast. And these poems were in the, um, the old text called the, the Terigata. And the poem that I want to read is, and all of these women come from many different walks of life. It's, it's amazing. And they, they all turn to the Dharma from different walks of life. And Patachara, 
um, is a, a 6th century BCE disciple of the Buddha. And this is her, um, her poem. It's called Patachara's 30 Nuns. Farmers take grain from the earth and branches from the trees. They crack open one with the other and take what's left to feed their families. You are all like unripe grain. grain. Take time to grow. Then leave the ground behind and let your husks be stripped away. I promise, less is more. So Patachara told us. So we sat on the ground like unripe grain. We gave ourselves to the path and the path broke us apart. What we feared most is now seen for what it is. True peace, freedom. All that broke apart was the darkness we had for so long been calling our whole world. What we feared most is now seen for what it is, true peace, freedom. All that broke apart was the darkness we had for so long been calling our whole world. So let's have a few moments of silence. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening. <laughs>